I've instructed Secretary Kerry to immediately begin discussions with Cuba to reestablish diplomatic relations that have been severed since January of 1961. Going forward, the United States will reestablish an embassy in Havana, and high-ranking officials will visit Cuba. Where we can... Only 90 miles separates the United States and Cuba, but for the last half century, they've been divided by revolution and ideology. With a new push towards normalization between the two countries, U.S. businesses are rushing to establish themselves on this island nation. What are the real opportunities for American businesses? Our journey will take us to meet experts in the field of U.S.-Cuba relations. What is the significance of the Panama December 17th, 2014 summit? Our first stop is one of the world's preeminent public policy institutions, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. We sit down with Carl Meacham, the director of the CSIS Americas program. Carl has spent more than a decade serving as a senior advisor on Latin America and the Caribbean for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The normalization process that has begun between the United States and Cuba is something that I think is uh, significant and long awaited. Uh, the handshake itself was symbolic on, on many levels and uh, the apology that came as well from Raul Castro to President Obama uh, I think left a lot of people speechless and that they didn't expect that sort of level of uh, niceties being exchanged between the, uh, the two leaders. Uh, it definitely signifies uh, sort of the end of the Cold War mentality that I believe both countries have had uh, towards each other. Uh, it is the beginning of a process. Of course, we still have the embargo in place, but the president used his executive authority to do as much as he could uh, by executive fiat uh, to make a change uh, in the policy towards Cuba. We meet Sandra Levinson, the executive director of the Center for Cuban Studies and Cuban Art Space. The center, located in New York City, is a pioneer in promoting the normalization of relations between the United States and Cuba. In 1991, Sandra spearheaded and won a groundbreaking lawsuit against the United States Treasury Department that made it legal to import original Cuban art. From the very beginning, what the center was concerned about was helping to normalize relations between the United States and Cuba. That's our main mission, you know. And on top of that, of course, to end the embargo. It's very interesting to me that now, when it seems that our mission is almost accomplished, that is, it looks like we're on the path to a normalization of relations, right? But the Helms-Burton law has made the embargo even tougher than it was at the beginning, much, much tougher. And without the Helms-Burton bill being rescinded, thrown out, disappeared, there is very little that can actually be done, for example, in terms of business. A few years ago, the embargo was lifted on food and medicine, but even that has been very reduced because the United States government has not allowed food and medicine businesses in the United States to sell to Cuba on credit, as they do to every other country. So the poor Cubans, with very little hard currency, have to pay up front for any medicines or food that they buy from the United States. This makes it extremely difficult. And it's somewhat amusing to me that now, because Obama and Raul Castro announced on December 17th that they're going to normalize relations, and since then, we've had a series of talks between the two governments, that everybody thinks they can now do business. But of course, they can't. The embargo is still in place. Jonathan Blue is chairman and managing director of Blue Equity, a private independent equity firm headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky. 
The firm's portfolio includes the successful sale of the nation's largest Spanish directory publications to Telmex International, owned by Mexican billionaire and the world's richest man, Carlos Slim. Something that was dormant for 60 years was no longer dormant when that summit happened. It was kind of an eye-opening event where it now said, okay, down the road, this could be a possibility for investors. No one in the U.S. thought about Cuba, except the people to whom you referred that were doing the agricultural shipments, the poultry shipments, and the things that have been going on that are permitted for all those years. So to me, when you talk about the summit, it was more of an eye-opening wake-up call for everybody to say, hey, this could be a serious thing down the road. In my mind, this is my opinion, and I'm not a politician, I will tell you that I think it's much more important for them symbolically, but I'll tell you practically in a minute why, to come off the state-sponsored terrorism list, because that opens up the banking. And the banking has been the thing that lacks. You, one cannot do business on a foreign market on cash. Must be able to have letters of credit, must be able to have general credit, must be able to have banking institutions. Whether they are correspondent or not correspondent, there has to be some relationship to do that. We've not had any ability to do that for all these years. The removal from the terrorist list is significant in two ways. Uh, one, in that it basically is as close as you're going to get to welcoming Cuba into sort of the family of nations. There's still uh, ways to go in different issues uh, with the Cubans, uh, from human rights to other issues that are of relevance to the bilateral relationship. But uh, this definitely removes them from pariah status. They're no longer in the same sort of bucket as countries like Yemen in that same sort of world as countries that are operating in the periphery of the international system. The second uh, issue is that it allows for Cuba to uh, be involved uh, in the financial system in a way that it hasn't before. It allows for financial transactions that had not occurred before uh, with Cuba to uh, occur. And it sort of sets the stage for a deeper involvement by Cuba in the international economic and financial system. John Kavulik is the president of the U.S.-Cuba Trade and Economic Council. John also serves as the editor-in-chief of the organization's publication, Economic Eye on Cuba. Since President Obama's December announcements, there have been a number of companies that have announced engagements. Uh, JetBlue Airways, which has already been operating charter flights. So there's nothing new there other than they're extending those charter flights, some new routes, but those have been in planning for quite a while. IDT signs an agreement with the Cubans to reestablish the undersea link for direct dial. Uh, that is significant. Netflix basically was just turning a key, it had nothing to do with infrastructure in Cuba, to allow for access not using private virtual networks. When Cuomo went down, for example, everybody was very excited. Of course, he was only there something like 27 hours. And he made a couple of deals. But obviously, that's very, very limited. I would like to see Governor Cuomo go to Washington and be one of many governors from states with food to sell to Cuba, which Cuba needs, by the way, go to Washington and do what they can to help bring down the Helms-Burton bill. That will end the embargo. But now you swing to 2015, Governor Cuomo going to Cuba. Uh, we assisted the governor's staff with that visit. I was highly critical of that visit, um, continue to be so, because he took down a JetBlue aircraft that seats about 140 people, and about 100 seats were empty when they could have been filled with business people. He took down seven representatives from companies in New York. And there were more that wanted to go, but the governor's staff said, well, no, we're gonna decide. Um, it was the most secretive and least transparent planning process of any of the nine previous governors who went to Cuba. And although you know, we have some announcements that have taken place, these have all been announcements that could have happened by themselves, may have happened by themselves, and didn't need it. He went down there for an optic. He went down there for his photo op. He didn't go down to lead a mission. Um, he went down for the mission to lead him. And uh, it, um, it was disappointing. It was disappointing. 
I think Governor Cuomo's trip is, is hugely important. Uh, you know, again, first of all, logistically, I don't think you can take 200 people down there and have any effective meetings with anyone regarding a train mission. That's one. It's too hard logistically to get around. It's too hard to move people from one point to another. The buses aren't even large enough to carry people in most cases. So it isn't like New York where we go out and we hire a bus and it's air conditioned and everything's fine. And we move from obviously vendor to vendor to vendor. Totally different down there. Secondly, uh, I think any announcement that happens, I know the, the chairman, I think, of Chobani was down there. I know, I think, uh, Mr. Nielsen from JetBlue was down there, I believe. Any announcement, whether they're already operating in the market or not, is important. It, it's incremental steps, but it's baby steps first. What's most important, you know, to an individual is being able to dream. And what's been so painful for me and others in all these years is that the Cubans haven't been able to dream big, even though they've been educated big, they have big health care, they have a lot of reasons to dream big, but our embargo has really prevented that from happening. So one of the things that's happening now with the economic reforms inside Cuba is that people are beginning to dream again and dream about what they can be and how they can, you know. So I think this is great and it does have a global impact. It has a global impact because Cuba is not isolated from anyone except the United States. They're looking at this as disruptive and they know that President Obama in December didn't say, you know, let Cuba be Cuba. Dictatorship, anarchy, monarchy, oligarchy, democracy, whatever you people want, God bless you, God keep you, be what you want, no. But I'm under no illusion about the continued barriers to freedom that remain for ordinary Cubans. The United States believes that no Cuban should face harassment or arrest or beatings simply because they're exercising a universal right to have their voices heard. And we will continue to support the civil society there. He spent 15 minutes standing at a podium wearing a dark suit talking about what he wanted to do to, for, and with the Cuban people to change Cuba. President Castro the same day, sitting in a desk, wearing a military uniform, speaks for less than five minutes vaguely. Uh, optics matter. A lot of people have been skeptical about the changes that have been enacted and the process that the president uh, has embarked on. Uh, they feel that it was a concession to the Cuban government, that the United States didn't get anything out of it, uh, and that we should have, if we were going to go along this path, that we should have gotten more return on our investment. Uh, I would beg to differ. I think that the policy of isolation that we had for the last 50 years didn't get us closer to being able to advance our interests, that being the interests uh, related to improving uh, the condition of people who have different views on the island, human rights, dissidents, but also uh, the issues having to do with our positioning uh, to demonstrate why democracy is better uh, than the model that Cuba currently has. Now remember, the other thing I think it's important about this market is our foreign countries today, as, as I learned from a long time ago, we're now really one market. Okay, this is not specific markets. Foreign countries are down there competing with the United States. Why let other countries that we compete with for other markets beat us there? So I just come from the straight economic point. Since we're closer, we have a strategic advantage. Let's take advantage of that and let's have prosperity for us, for the Cubans, and for everybody involved. I think it's really, really important when everyone else is down there and all the other countries in the world, it's time for us to also play in that market.